Hello. Yeah, I'm Sophia. I'm a third year PhD student working in um, Rogers lab. Um, I'd like to do a couple of things today. Um, first of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how the brain actually changes with age and why that might be. Um, also, um, it turns out that measuring human brain aging is not a trivial task. <laughs> so um, introduce you a little bit to how we actually go about measuring human brain aging. And then finally, um, spend a little bit of time, and this will be discussed much more later on, um, on the sort of million dollar question, uh, which is whether there's anything that we can do to age more healthily. So what you're going to see in the next photo are two brains. One belongs to a 90, 90 year old person, and the other one to a 25 year old person. Both have kindly donated their brains to research after they passed away. Um, take a look. Any guesses as to which one might belong to the old person? The one on the right. Yes, correct. So one of the um, maybe most, most striking findings is that as the human brain ages, it shrinks. And we've known that for quite a while. Um, however, it's not always been clear why it shrinks. For a long time, people thought it must be because um, the cells in the brain die. But it turns out that the story is actually a little bit different. So to know, to understand that, it's important to have an idea of what brain cells are like. So uh, here's a neuron. Um, they, they make up a vast proportion of cells in the brain. Um, they're in some ways similar to other cells that you might be familiar with. So they have a, a cell body and a nucleus and so on. But really, they're quite different uh, in many ways because they are basically specialized to communicate with other cells in the human body, or in the human brain, I mean. And they do that in two ways. So one way is that they have this axon here. It looks like it's quite short on this slide, but actually it could be really, really quite long. And the axon, uh, via the axon, the neuron transmits or sends signals, electrical signals, from, from one end of the cell to the other end. And the axon has, is wrapped around, wrapped around the axon is something called myelin. And myelin is white. And just remember that it's white because we'll, go, we'll come back to that in a moment. Anyway, the signal flows to the axon, gets to the end of that neuron, and here the signal is picked up by other neurons. And the way it's picked up is via what's called dendrites here. So here, this neuron might have, I don't know, a dozen or so dendrites. But actually, a neuron could have hundreds of dendrites. And what happens is that these dendrites sort of pick up signals all, all the time. Um, and that's how the brain communicates between different cells. So as I said, people used to think that the brain shrinks because the cells die. But actually, it seems to be something else. So what you can see here is an actual neuron of a rat's brain. So uh, young, uh, child rat, and adolescent rat, and adult rat, and old rat. Here is the uh, cell body, the axon, and down here are the dendrites. And you can see that as the rat ages, there are more dendrites, many more dendrites, but then the dendrites seem to disappear. And this, I th it, this is what we think is driving brain shrinkage. It's not necessarily that the, all the cells are dying, it's that there is a reduction in dendrites. Now, it's interesting to think about that we're looking at rats, dendrites, and neurons. But me and everybody else at this institute is quite interested in human brain aging. Um, we can't look at human brain aging in this way, so we have to come up with different ways of doing it. Um, one thing, uh, different ways of measuring brain aging. And one thing <laughs> that we rely on very heavily, although there are other techniques as well, is something that you might have already been uh, part of even, or at least have heard of, and that's what life brain is also all about. It's magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. Now, basically, it's a brain scanner. Uh, I'm not going to talk very much about how they work. Just to say, perhaps, that unlike X-ray, brain uh, MRI is not harmful to the human body. So we can scan people many, many times, which is nice. Um, so here you can see a brain scanner, the, the feet of the pers person. The person is currently lying in the scanner being scanned. Here are the researchers looking at his or her brain. So when you do this kind of brain scanning, this is a kind of an image that you might get. So I'm just going to walk you through that because 
probably not everybody here is a, a familiar. So this is the brain of a, in this case, 19-year-old person. Now, the, this is a photo sort of taken from the top of the brain, so kind of looking down at the brain. And you can see that there is some white stuff and there is some gray stuff. And neuroscientists have very intelligently called that white matter and gray matter. <laughs> um, so I told you about the white, oh, sorry, this is bad. Let's, let's not start. I told you about the white stuff already. The white matter is white because that's where the axons are, the stuff that transmits information all the time. Um, uh, basically, you can think of the white matter a bit like roads. So it's like how the brain sends information from one area of the brain to another. It does that via the axons, and they're flowing all over the place. The gray matter, it's a bit harder to see. For example, that's the stuff sort of wrapped around the right stuff, the white stuff. That's where, where most of the cell body and indeed most of the dendrites seem to be located. It's also often called cortex. Um, I'm going to show you now how the human brain ages and how that looks like <laughs> in an MRI scanner. Unfortunately, MRI hasn't been around for long enough for us to scan the same person from 19 to 86 or whatever. Um, so this are, these are different brains, but we've put them in such a way that you can compare them quite well. So I'm just going to show you now and just pay attention and see what kinds of changes you can spot. So unless you're uh, an expert in neuroanatomy, uh, which do, in which case you will outsmart me, um, uh, I'm going to just compare them again for you here. So here you have a 19-year-old brain again, and this is the 86-year-old brain. Now, maybe what's most striking to you are these black things. <laughs> I can guarantee you that they look scarier than they are. <laughs> this is not a tumor or cancer or anything like that. These are ventricles. Ventricles are filled with a fluid which bathes the brain inside our head. And the fluid increases, so the ventricles increase, the fluid fills up, and that's what happens. It's very normal, it's not a problem. So this is sort of, uh, those, those, those bla black things here are the ventricles. There are four of them. Um, what seems to be um, maybe, well, what, what, another interesting part of brain aging is changes in the gray matter. So maybe they're a little bit less easy to see, but just compare, for example, this part of the brain here. So you see a lot of gray matter wrapped around the white stuff. But then if you look over here, much less so. So we see these reductions in gray matter. And given what I told you earlier, that dendrite reduction seems to be driving shrinkage, and that dendrites are in the gray matter, it makes sense that we should find this change in gray matter. And indeed, because we've been doing lots of neuroimaging over the years, um, we can draw some sort of inferences from this kind of work. For example, we can say, right, what happens to the whole brain volume as the brain ages? I don't think you'll be surprised to find out that it goes down. Um, here you can see whole brain volume on the y-axis. And these dots here are actually individual human beings who were scanned for one of the data sets that's used in LifeBrain, ChemCan, here at the unit. Some of uh, them are actually here in the audience today. And you can see that volume reduce w goes down as people get older. Now, that's a reduction there. And to really uh, make the point again about what I said earlier about the gray matter specifically, um, we can also not just look at the whole volume but everything at once, but we can try and s look at more gray matter specifically. And the way that we would do that is by looking at what's called cortical thickness. That's what you can see here. So again, you have a brain. Here's a sort of enlarged version. You can see the white matter, the gray matter. And if you just measure the stuff with the yellow arrows on it, you get a measure of cortical thickness. And now, this is what you would find when you do that, a much steeper reduction. So what you find, basically, is that gray matter relative to other parts of the brain seem to be reducing faster than, say, white matter, for example. So I have now told you a lot about reductions and shrinkage. And I can understand, if you're sitting in the audience, feeling a little bit like this. <laughs> 
now, well, I have some good news for you. Brain shrinkage and reduction in size is not necessarily a bad thing. There is a very interesting thing called cognitive reserve. And cognitive reserve was first observed in the 1930s, so way before we had brain imaging. And what people found was, when they looked at dead people's brains post-mortem, some of these brains looked like the person should have had dementia or Alzheimer's, or she really should not have been doing so well. But the person was totally fine. Mm -hmm. So how can it be that we can have very little or very few cognitive symptoms or cognitive uh, uh, illnesses, but pronounced brain illnesses? Um, that's the question of cognitive reserve, and a lot of research is going on all the time to try and figure it out. Um, one thing that people have been looking at since then, basically, is to understand what might be driving cognitive reserve. Why is it that some people have it and others don't, really? Um, a really well-replicated finding is that um, education seems to be important. So it seems that having more education might add to your cognitive reserve abilities. And the similar thing is true for what we often call occupational complexity. So, um, you know, if your job involves, I don't know, saving lives or learning Mozart off by heart, then maybe that sets you up quite nicely for having more of that reserve. But the problem with this sort of approach is it's nice, but it, it would kind of suggest that, well, you know, if you haven't received an education when you were younger, or you have, or you've picked your job, you're retired, is that it? Are you doomed? Is that, is that all you can ever do? And it seems that no, you are not. In addition to this sort of stuff, we're also finding that people's more modifiable lifestyle activities are also um, uh, perhaps adding to their cognitive and neural health. Um, we, you will hear much more about this in the next talk, so I won't say too much about it. But essentially, we're finding here at the unit and elsewhere that things like intellectual activities, I don't know, reading, learning a language, playing chess, social activities, hanging out with your grandchildren and friends, p taking part in um, uh, community organizations, that kind of stuff, and also uh, physical activities, especially cardiovascular ones, all of these seem to be contributing to uh, aging more healthily. Now, um, that's cool, and it's interesting, and there's a lot of work into this, but what this sort of stuff doesn't tell you is why. Why is it that having a higher education or having more, doing more, more things, uh, being more engaged in your life, why does that seem to help? Now, the short answer is that we don't really know, but there are different theories floating around in the space of science. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to present to you one of those theories in the last couple of minutes. Um, take it with a grain of salt. This stuff is not conclusively proven. It's a theory. It's been tested in some ways and not in others. So it's just an idea. I'll show it to you anyway. You can, uh, you can just see what you think of it. Um, to understand the theory, you have to know that inside the brain is something called this LC. It's basically a little nucleus that sits in your brainstem, in the back of your brain, and the brainstem connects to your spine, just so you know where it is. This LC produces a lot of brain chemicals called noradrenaline. These brain chemicals flow through the entire brain, as you can see here on the red, with the red stuff. Now, lots of different animal studies and some human work has shown that in the, pr the presence of noradrenaline seems to have protective effects. So think of it a bit like a shield. When there's no adrenaline, it seems to protect some of, that, some of those brain areas from uh, those uh, uh, brain changes that I told you about. The question now is, OK, this might be good. What triggers it? What makes this LC produce this chemical? And what some people are arguing is it might be novelty and mental challenge, activities that challenge you, that make you uh, think of things you haven't thought before, that make you do things you haven't done before. So it can, it's possible that education, occupational complexity, but also this engaged lifestyle, what they have in common is that they can challenge you. And therefore, it might be that that continuous challenge throughout a person's life might be what's at least in part explaining healthy aging in this way. So just to conclude, I've shown you that the brain shrinks with age. I've told you why it does. I've showed you that we measure this sort of stuff with structure MRI, and that we can, co we can quite nicely tie in the stuff that we're finding in neuroimaging with more with animal models, what I showed you about the rat. 
I've also shown you that cognitive reserve refers to the mind refers to the mind's resistance to damage to the brain. So despite brain damage, people are sometimes still fine. Um, and we've also learned, and you'll hear more about this now, that education, occupational complexity, and lifestyle engagement contributes to uh, people's cognitive reserve capacities. Um, so finally, I've just given you a theory, it's something people are working on, that uh, this LC uh, and noradrenaline could be part of a biological explanation for cognitive reserve and for healthy aging. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.